Good evening, everybody. Looks like I've got five people here right now. How many of you have started the homework? I know, Melinda, you have started. Has anyone else started on the homework? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. It's been a long week for me, too. Each week seems to be a long week. So I do know that um, I would tell you that this chapter is a fairly straightforward chapter and that it it's not one of the more difficult. Melinda might disagree with me. Um, some of the some of the stock transactions are a little confusing. Somehow I got somehow I've been sitting here clicking through the slides and went on the first slide. But um, maybe after we go through these slides and talk a little bit about the definitions and how the stock work, yeah, it's, it's not a really tough week. And then we hit chapter twelve. Chapter ten is much better than chapter nine was. I, in my opinion, and then we get to chapter 12, and that can be a rather difficult chapter. And then chapter 13 is pretty much a breeze chapter again, and then we'll just be ready to do all of our testing. So three chapters to go, counting this one, because we skip 11. So it it's we're getting there. We're almost done. Everybody needs to apply themselves to the best of their ability and get their grades up as much as they possibly can. Um, most of you who are online tonight are doing a great job in the class. It's the people who who aren't coming to the seminars who seem to be doing a poor job. But for the most part, the class works out pretty well if you do your homework and do what you're supposed to do on time. So let's talk about stockholders' equity. I may get through this a little faster tonight. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, as usual, please ask. It's good to um, to try to answer the questions as I go. Somebody was here and then gone. Let me see if they. Okay. Can everybody see this slide? I think I've got my screen sharing on. Yeah, I think everybody should be okay. Yeah, all right. So stockholders' equity. The learning objectives in this chapter are to explain the features of a corporation, account for the issuance of stock, to show how treasury stock affects a company, to account for retained earnings, dividends, and splits, to use stock values in decision making, and to report stockholders' equity transactions in the financial statements. Almost everybody in this class will have had Business 101 or some other type of business or accounting course along the way and understand already some of the advantages of a corporation. We also talked about that in the very beginning chapter of this book, of why it would be good to incorporate a business versus doing a sole proprietorship or a partnership. Some of the advantages are we can raise more capital more quickly than you can in a proprietorship or partnership. It has a continuous life, meaning if the proprietor dies or the partnership in, the, in a partnership, if one of the partner dies, the business is dissolved, as it was previously known. It does not mean that someone can't, can't start the business up with a different name. You can take in a new partner. You can start a separate sole proprietorship. Keep the name of the company but or the DBA doing business as, but change the owner's name. It's easy to transfer ownership. You can just sell shares of the company instead of having to actually sell the whole asset, all the assets together. And there's limited liability for the stockholders, meaning the amount that you can use is just the amount lose is the amount you have invested. Disadvantages, it's got separation of ownership and management. There's double taxation. 
and government regulation is in place much more, enforced a lot more heavily on corporations than it is on sole proprietorships and, and partnerships. In order to organize a corporation, you want to pick the state that's, that's the best for um, you to, to incorporate in. Different states have different charter fees that you have to pay, different annual fees that you have to pay. You do not have to incorporate in the state that you're actually doing your physical business in, which is somewhat interesting. So corporate organiza organizers obtain a charter from the state. This is authorization to issue shares of stock, which is stated in, in the charter. You must pay fees to the state. You have to sign the charter. You have to file documents with the state, and you have to agree to a set of bylaws. Once you have a corporation in place, you have to have your, your board of director elected, and you, you have to actually do meetings and minutes every year. One way to structure a corporation is to have your stockholders to elect your board of directors, who then elects the chairman of the board and the chief executive officer officers and chief operating officers. And then they would hire the staff below them. So the, the board of directors is going to basically just hire the two top people in the company or the one top person in the company in some cases. Stockholder rights include voting rights. If you have common stock, the only class of stock you have is one class would be common. And that gives your, your stockholders voting rights. They have a right to receive a proportionate share of any dividend that's paid out. If you have to liquidate the company, they are going to receive their proportionate share of any assets remaining after the corporation pays its liabilities in liquidation. And preemption is the right to maintain one's proportionate ownership in, in the company. Therefore, if a company decided to issue another 100,000 shares of stock and you owned already 10% of the stock that was outstanding, they would have to offer you the chance to buy 10% of that $100,000 shares that they were offering. Most, most charters exclude this right so that they don't have to allow the stockholders to do that. The stockholders' equity section of the balance sheet, we've looked at this many times. There are two different sections, the paid in capital sections and the retained earning section. Paid in capital, you might also see it called contributed capital. This is the amount of equity that the stockholders have contributed. So this would be your, your common stock, your preferred stock, or any additional paid in capital that was associated with that stock issue. Retained earnings, again, we've talked about this definition many times. This is the increased um, the increased earnings we've had through the life of the business, less any dividends that we have paid out. So it's a cumulative total of all incomes throughout the life of the business, less its dividends. If the slide that I just popped up now, um, is loading for you. This is an example of a stock certificate. It's it's kind of funny. One of my face-to-face -face students said, so if you have stock in a company, do you always have a certificate that looks like this? And, you know, I have to say the answer to that is no, you don't. Um, I, I do have a few stock certificates, but they are mostly um, through cooperatives such as Harvest Land or there used to be a company called Farmer's Grain that I have some stock certificates in. My S Corp, I have a book that has stock certificates in it. I've never issued a single one of them. Um, everybody just knows how many shares they have according to the paperwork. But any shares that I have that are in part of my investments are, are just basically a statement from my broker saying you own this many shares and I do not have a stock certificate. Do any of you have Oh yeah, Shad says he gets a statement. So, Shad, you don't get, you don't have any certificates either, right? That look anything like this. Nope. Yeah. So, don't. Like I said, the only ones I have are from the the little cooperatives that 
that you get um, get stuck in, and it's you know you don't they're not really worth anything. It's just I think to try to make you feel better um, for spending all your money there. So there's different classes of stock. You'll hear me talk about which class of stock is it. Is it common stock? And you heard me already say I'm sure that if a company only has one class of stock, it's common. Um, common stock is the basic form of stock. There are four basic rights that go along with common stock. Shareholders benefit the most if the corporation succeed. And common stock usually is taking on more risk. Preferred stock, there are some advantages. You receive your dividends first. You receive assets first in case of a liquidation. The shareholders earn a fixed dividend. However, very few corporations issue preferred stock. In fact, if you look at this little graphic on its Exhibit 10-4, if you have, have access to your book and or access to the slides, um, Exhibit 10-4 shows that only 9% of corporations offer preferred stock at all. If you go out and you are looking to purchase stock on the stock market, you it's, it's very difficult to locate preferred stock, and then it's also very pricey. Um, so most people don't invest anyway. Is there an obligation to repay the principal on, on either class of common or preferred stock? No, but if you have long-term debt, you do have to pay that back. Dividends, interest um, on the corporation's income statement, dividends are not tax de deductible. It's not a tax expense. Interest expense, however, is tax deductible. So if we had just borrowed money to pay back, then we could deduct the interest expense. And is there an obligation to pay dividends or interest? You do not have to pay dividends. A company does not ever have to pay dividends. If they have declared them, they have to. But if that, as long as they don't declare that they're going to pay dividends, they do not have to pay. And yes, you are obligated to pay interest. You will hear the terminology of par value or no par. Par is just an arbitrary amount that was assigned to the share of stock. It's usually set really low to help avoid legal issues. Um, most states do not allow companies to issue stock below par. So if you decided to have your stock par value be $1,000 a, sh a share, uh, you couldn't sell it for less than that. It would be illegal to sell it for $500 a share. So if they set their stock, you'll see stock set at pennies, you'll see stock set at fractions of a penny, you'll see a lot of dollar common stock, um, and that's just to avoid the legal issues. And the way we account for that difference is the additional paid in capital accounts. You may see no par stock. Um, the no par stock may have a stated value, which is it behaves just like par value. It's it's no par stock, but it has a stated value of, say, $5. And then we would list it as $5 on our balance sheet per share. There's just standard transactions that you use. These are pretty straightforward. There's the examples. These, these are the examples out of the book, out of the chapters that are on the slides. But they, they should guide you through your homework transactions that you have to do. If we were issuing a thousand, no, that's not where we were. If I was going to issue Home Depot's common stock and carry to par value equal to its issuance price of ten dollars per share, it would just be the ten million shares at ten dollars to be a hundred million dollars cash. We would collect for that, and it would be common stock as our credit. Common stock is a stockholder's equity account, increases on the credit side. If we issue our stock above par value, for example, if it had a par value of five cents per share, and we issued the 10 million shares at $10 per share, then we would still get the same $100 million cash, but our common stock would only be 500000 because that's five cents times our our 10 million shares, and then all the difference would be our paid in capital, sometimes called additional paid in capital. On the stockholders' equity 
section of the balance sheet, it's interesting that this is where you come up with lots of times the information you need to solve your homework problems. In this case, we had common stock five cents per par, 10,000 or 10 billion shares authorized, 10 million shares issued and outstanding. That tells us a lot of things. It tells us what our total legal capital is, which would be 10 million. 10 billion times 5 cents would be the most we could ever have in our common stock account. This tells us that we currently have 10 mil million shares issued, and those are all outstanding shares of stock. That means if dividends were declared at this point in time, we would be paying dividends on 10 million shares of stock. Um, cap, if we had purchased back any stock, that would reduce this amount if we had any treasury stock in our list. So we have our total paid in capital amount of our stockholders equity here, the hundred million. Um, and then our retained earnings to get our total stockholders equity. Here is an example of no par stock. If Apple issued 939 million shares of no par common stock for, for 16,422 million, Apple stock issuance entry would just be the amount of cash and the common stock because it was no par stock. And here's an example of them reporting their stock on the balance sheet. If we are issuing for other items besides cash, then it matters what the fair market value or the market value of the items we are purchasing is because that's how we value our stock. So in this case, we had a dollar par common stock. We were issuing it for equipment with a market value of 4000 and a building with a market value of 120000 Those are both assets increased on the debit side. So we now need to come up with 124000 in credits to keep our debits and credits equal in our transaction. So those are the firm numbers we have, the 4000 and the 120. So then we know that we have a dollar par stock and we issued 15,000 shares. So $15,000 becomes our common stock amount and any difference has to be our additional paid in capital or our paid in capital in excess of par. We have to make sure our debits and credits equal in each transaction. That rule hasn't changed. This is just another example. In the last example we used um, stock to purchase an asset. In this case, we're using stock to pay a legal expense. Again, our expense increases on the debit side. Um, the bill was 25,000 and they agreed to take 2,500 shares of a dollar par stock. So again, 2,500 shares at a dollar is $2,500. That's our common stock and the difference has to be paid in capital. These are pretty repetitive. Um, why do companies use PAR if it's not necessary? It's an arbitrary amount that if you state it in your, your charter, then that lets you know each time you go to do your entry how much your total legal capital can be, if that makes any sense. For instance, if we had, if our, if our charter said that we could have 10,000 shares of a dollar par stock. The most that we would ever have in our common stock would be $10,000. That's when we had all of our stock outstanding. It's just easier to know what to value your stock at, or not necessarily value, but how to record your stock when you have par value. Does that make any sense at all? I hope so. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me some nights when I'm trying to talk. 
preferred stock, it follows the same accounting pattern. We're going to still have a, a par value or a stated value for that stock. And we will have separate accounts for paid in capital and excess of par for preferred and common stock. We can issue with this with the conversion. Some preferred stock will allow preferred shareholders to exchange for common stock at some point down the road if that's what they choose to do. In this case, if we were issuing prefer convertible preferred stock that had a par value of a dollar and we issued 50,000 shares at its par value, it would just be cash and then stock, whatever class our stock is or what our account is called. If we issued it at, um, let's see, we converted, oh, this is a conversion of the preferred stock at a rate of 6.25 to 1, so 8,000 shares of the dollar par common stock is issued in exchange for 15,000 shares or 50,000 shares of preferred stock. And the difference becomes our paid in capital and excess of par for our common stock. And this is just converting our shareholders who had the convertible preferred stock decided that they did want to trade it in for the common stock. Terminology. This terminology will get you in your homework if you don't understand the difference between authorized, issued, and outstanding stock. Authorized is the amount of stock that the maximum amount of stock that the company can issue under its charter. Issued is the number of shares the company has issued or sold. Issue and sell means the same thing. That's when we're, we're getting the stock out to our stockholders. Outstanding is the number of shares of stock that the stockholders own and that is still in the hands of the stockholders. Pay close attention to that, that the outstanding is still in the hands of the stockholders because as we move to the second part of the chapter, we start talking about treasury stock, which is actually the next slide, but we're going to start talking about how treasury stock affects our outstanding shares of stock. It affects what dividends get paid and and shows up separately on the statement of stockholders' equity. Who authorizes the stock? The stock is authorized by the charter. So this in the state, the state where you charter your stock or set up your corporation, the state authorizes it. Yes. The state with whom you register, that is correct. So if I have a, an S Corp, my S Corp is authorized by the state of Indiana. How do you get more stock than what they authorize? Um, not without doing a new stock offering paperwork. So you always want to make sure that you authorize as much stock. We can um, do stock splits, however, and the chapter talks about that. So if I had authorized 10,000 shares of stock, dollar par stock, and I decided, yes, yes, I said, yes, you can, can. it's not really called recharter, but we can go back and, and rework our original charter or authorization through, um, through movement by the Board of Directors. If the Board of Directors vote to change the charter, then we can do that. With the approval of the state, of course. We have to have approval of the state. Um, you're asking me questions, and now I'm losing my train of thought. So that's not hard to do. Um, with the outstanding shares, is that where I was at? Oh, it's ready to move on to treasury stock, right? Yeah, I can tell by your big grin that you're really sorry for, for getting me off track. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, as we go forward and we look at the treasury stock and how it affects the company, treasury stock are, 
is stock, the company's own stock, that has previously been issued or sold to the to stockholders out in the open market. And the company itself decides to re reacquire those shares of stock that are out there. Why might a company do that? Maybe they do stock options to their employees um, as part of a benefit plan, and they don't want to give up more ownership. So if they go out and they buy back shares of stock that have been previously issued, then they're, they're keeping their ownership. Um, they may want to buy their stock low. Maybe the price is just it's not selling for what they think it's worth, and so they're going to go out and buy it low and then resell it, and they'll make a little money that way. Keep in mind that they can't do that if they know they're getting ready to release something. They have to avoid at all costs the appearance of insider trading, that they go out and they buy stock up or, or buy buy shares in the company even that is newly issued stock when they're going to come out with something new and information that they know about that the public may not know about. You may want to avoid takeover. If you have more than 50% of your company um, out on the open stock market and you start seeing a lot of movement of someone buying up large chunks of your of your stock, they may be, may be trying to get away with the hostile takeover. You'll see that you you know you don't see it a lot in the news. You see it a lot on TV. I mean if you're watching TV stories or um, maybe soap operas. Do I have any soap opera watchers? I I used to watch soap operas when I was really a really young mother for a little bit, but I haven't watched soap operas in years. <laughs> yeah, we don't watch them. But those that's the type of thing you'll see a lot of hostile takeovers going on, and you'll see it in some of the evening shows. <laughs> oh, come on, Chad. You know you watch them. So um, anyway, if I don't want someone to take over my company and there a lot of my stock is moving, then I might need to go out and buy my company stock back up myself to control that. I can increase my earnings per share if I have less outstanding stock because earnings per share is computed by net income divided by my number of common stock outstanding, so that would definitely improve my earning per share number. Um, we're going to use, and we could use these in a share repurchase program as well. Um, we may be going to just, just have less stock outstanding all the time. You can buy stock back just to retire that stock as well and to never plan to issue it again. So how do we record treasury stock? We record it at cost. There, you know, we record it at whatever we paid for it when we went out and bought it back. And it is it has a debit normal balance because it is a contra retained earnings account. So it reduces our retained earnings. If we had repurchased 74 million shares of stock for four billion dollars. We would just re record it for the $4 billion. When we get ready to resell some of that, if that's our plan, and we get to resell it for $55 per share, we had paid $54.05 per share. Then we have paid in capital from the resale of that or from Treasury stock transactions. Looking at a stockholder's equity section for Hartnett Corporation, if they had common stock, $1.50 par value per share, 24 million shares, 2,400 million shares issued. You multiply the 2,400 by the $1.50 to get your 3,6, 3,600. We had paid in capital. We went out and purchased the SPAC some treasury stock. We have at 85000 it shows as a negative. Just a little example of, 
of what the different transactions are going to look like here on the stockholders equity section. So if we were going to record the issuance of 16 million shares of the common stock for $10 per share, the common stock, if you recall, had a $1.50 par value, so 16 million times a $1.50. We got cash at the actual $10 for the 16 million, and the difference is the paid in capital in excess of par. Okay, what would the transaction look, transaction look like to record the purchase of 6 million shares of Treasury stock for 100 million? And the sale of $3 million of Treasury stock purchased in Part B for 70 million. So we just record the Treasury stock at what we paid for it, spit the money, when we reissue it, we issue it back out at what we paid for it. If we paid 16.67 and then we had our paid in capital. If we were going to issue stock for an employee compensation, it becomes compensation expense. Again, we record the common stock at the par value and we have our paid-in capital. How do we record dividends and splits? Well, if you recall from doing our um, statement of retained earnings in earlier chapters, our retained earnings was our net income or net losses added to our beginning retained earnings less our dividends that we had paid out. And remember that was accumulated over the corporation's lifetime or the lifetime of the business. We have a credit balance in our retained earnings if our lifetime earnings is greater than our lifetime losses and dividends that have been paid out. We have a debit balance if our lifetime earnings are less than the losses and dividends that we paid out. You cannot pay out dividends if, you've got, if you don't have the retained earnings to support it, however, so keep that in mind. Should a company declare and pay dividends? What do you think? Should every company declare and pay dividends? Katrina thinks yes. Melinda says not every. Shad thinks probably so. It, Katrina thinks it's fair, right? If you want happy stockholders, those are all good. Not every, if you need to reinvest, okay, that's right, Blue, if you need to reinvest your money, then if the company needs to reinvest the money, then they should reinvest the money to build the company for more future earnings. I would tell you there are some companies that absolutely never pay out dividends. They don't declare them. They don't pay them. They put their, they reinvest their money in the growth that you get on your price of stock is your earnings. Um, realistically, most of us would rather our stock gain value than to get the 50 cent dividend that they pay out per share every quarter or whatever that is. It's usually a pretty small dividend by the time it goes to all the owners. But the value of owning stock is in the increased value that you get over what you pay for it. So dividends are just our, di our distribution by the corporation to its stockholders, they're usually based on earnings, and they can be cash, stock, or 
non-cash assets that they distribute out. In order to have cash dividends, the company must have enough re retained earnings to declare that dividend, and they also must have enough cash to pay the dividend they have declared. The Board of Directors has an authority to declare that dividend. The company is not obligated to pay a dividend until the Board of Directors declares that they are going to or mandates that they're going to. There are three relevant dates that are important. These are good multiple choice questions. Um, the declaration date, the date of record, and the payment date. The declaration date is the date that the Board of Directors does declare those dividends. That requires a journal entry to put the dividend payables on the book. The date of record, which states there is no entry, is it would be stated in that declaration something along the lines of um, they declared $100,000 dividends be paid to the stockholders of record on December 31st, 2014, right? So if you sold your stock on December 30th, 2014, you would not get that dividend because you would not be a stockholder of record on the 31st. And then your payment date, the date that you pay it, then you you take it back out of your dividends payable and pay cash. So here's some examples of a declaration. On the declaration date, the Board of Directors declared a $50,000 cash dividend. Okay. It shows us here all the way back to what we were learning in the very first few chapters because it doesn't change is that we have increased our liabilities and decreased our stockholders' equity and that keeps our, our accounting equation in balance. On Ju July 10th, the company paid the declared dividends and they recorded that payment. To look at how that affected our retained earnings, we had a beginning in balance of 17246 We increased our net income by 4535 credit side. We paid out dividends on the debit side of 1743 and that gave us an ending balance of 20038 So here is another little example. They want us to record and the declaration and payment of the cash dividends of $32 million. So just the standard dividends payable. To pay it, we just take it right back out with cash. If we have dividends on preferred stock, this is done just a little differently. Um, first of all, if you have preferred stock, you get your dividends paid before any common stockholders would get theirs. If there's not enough money declared, then the common stockholders would get nothing and the preferred stockholders would get it all. It is stated as a percent of the par value or a dollar amount per share. I do know that in your homework it shows it both ways. It's given as a percent of par and it's also given as a dollar amount that would be given per share. So you need to pay close attention to that when you're doing some of your calculations in your homework. This stock may be cumulative. If preferred stock is cumulative, that means you have to go back and pay any stock that is in arrears. So if a company has not declared dividends for five years and then they declare $100,000 cash dividends, the cumulative preferred stockholders get their dividends for the past five years before anybody else gets any dividends. It's, it's just almost the same as debt if you think about it because they, you always have to pay it, go back and pay it if you ever declare dividends. If you never declare a dividend, you never have to pay it. So if you're paying dividends though, it's about the same as debt, behaves much in the same manner. So here's an example. Um, 
They passed the preferred dividend of 150000 in 2013. Before paying the dividends to Common in 2014, they must first pay preferred dividends of 150 for both 2013 and 14, or a total of $300,000 to their preferred stockholders. Yeah, because they did not pay for 13. So once declared in 14, they have two years to pay. They only declared $500,000. The, the preferred shareholders get $300,000 of that. That leaves dividends payable allowable to $200,000 to your common stockholders. Okay, here's a little illustration, and uh, let's see if you can work through this one. We have preferred stock with a cumulative a dollar par, 6%, 900,000 shares issued. We have common stock at 30 cent par, 9,130,000 shares are issued. Um, they have paid all dividends through 2011. And let's see. Okay, so compute the total amount of dividends to both preferred and common for 2014-2015. If the total dividends are 90000 in 2014 and 270000 in 2015, can somebody tell me how much we have to give to the preferred stockholders each year? Okay, it's 6% dollar per stock. So how much is it per share? Okay. So I'm getting from $5,400 per year. So that's total, right, for all 90,000 shares. So how much was it per share of stock? Yeah, six cents a share. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, six cents per share for, for the preferred stock. So for 2014, It's 54 a year, as you said, times 2 is 10,008 for the current year. Fifty four hundred sixteen two. So the common shareholders get a total of 73,000, right? So what happens in 2015 when they declare $270,000? How much did the preferred stockholders get and how much did the common stockholders get? You think this is the one that only uses the last year? Yep. For the current year, the preferred, this is current year because we have updated it in the previous year. We took care of all of the dividends in arrear when we paid the 2014 dividends. 
So we only need to pay the preferred stockholders their $5,400. The rest goes to the common stockholders, okay? And that's just because we already had caught them up from the previous years. It wasn't, what if we paid them in the 2014 this, or what if we didn't pay in 2014 and then it was the 2015. It's the two separate, separate items. So the things to remember are that you have to be able to calculate your how much per share to get your amount that you owe the preferred first, and then when we're going in arrears, how many years in arrears are we to total those up? If we have a stock dividend, these are proportional distributions of stock to shareholders. It increases the stock account and decreases the retained earnings. The total equity is unchanged. Um, total stockholders' equity would remain the same. It, it changes the paid in section versus the retained earnings section. Why would we do stock dividends? We want to continue dividends but not spend any cash. And it will also help to reduce the market price of our shares. If it depending on the size of the stock dividend, we need to record it differently. If it's 25 or percent, 25 percent or less than our total stock, we would record it at market value. If it's greater than 25%, we have to record it at par value. And that would be governed by GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. If we have a stock, <laughs> stock split, then we can increase the number of shares with a proportionate reduction in par. Why would I want to lower the cost of shares of stock? The, the good thing about lowering the cost of shares of stock on the market is that more buyers can afford to buy or might be interested in buying. I, I mean, if you think about, think about just if, if we were all going to go out and invest. I mean, I'm not going to spend thousands of dollars for a share of stock, and I doubt if many of you would either. But let's say it's a really good stock, a really good company that we would, would love to invest in, but the stock is selling for $100 a share. And then the company decides to do either a, a stock dividend to lower the shares or what we're talking about here, a stock split where they say, oh, we're going to do a four for one split. That would mean that, that the value of the stock should fall from $100 to $25 when that initial split happens. It would change the par value. If the par value was a dollar and we did a four for one split, it would drop to 25 cents. But we could then issue four times as many shares. So the total capital in common stock or in our preferred stock would remain the same, um, the total capital per the charter, but we could have more shares of stock at a lesser par value. Yeah, lots of companies do stock splits. PNG did stock splits several years ago. You're right. Um, the stockholders do get an increase from it. If you are a stockholder who had, you were holding 100 shares of stock in a company and they did a four for one split, you would then own 400 shares of stock, but your par value would be the same. But it gives you a chance to grow more. Who decides this? This is going to be a board of director decision again on whether they decide to do a stock split or not. They're going to vote that in their in their annual meetings. You as stockholders then would, you know, like I say, you get to vote on the board of directors. So if that's something you don't like, then you vote to change to your board of directors. But it's it lowers the price of stock. It makes it more affordable may if your stock has become stagnant because it's gotten too pricey to be moving on the stock market. This is a is an option for a company to revalue. It doesn't re really revalue the company. The company value stays the same, but it revalues the stock so you can have more investors. Yep, they can, they do, they quadruple. If it's a four for one split, they multiply the number of shares by four and divide the par by four. If it's a two for one split, then you would double the number of shares of stock. 
You thought they were losing money when they did a stock split, Blue? You thought that's why they did it? Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. But yeah, you see now that what they're doing is the value is actually staying the same of their stock. It's just that they have more shares and, and how it can make it more marketable to more people because more people can afford to invest. Okay. And that, you know, that's important. Yeah. I don't know. I I don't know why people get upset when people do stock splits. Um, maybe some of the longtime stockholders didn't want the value of the stock to drop. Um, maybe they they felt they felt more secure with less investors. Yeah. Yeah. I like stock splits too um, because I I mean I don't have much as I say all the time I don't have very much stock but I really like for a company to do a split because I feel like it increases the growth opportunity of the stock I have um, right I've only had two for one splits too you know Shad says he's had his two for one so it is it it does provide growth opportunity and it provides more more um, funding for a company because more people are willing to invest. And the interesting thing is you don't need to do any journal entry when you do a stock split because it doesn't change any value on your financial statements. You make a note of it, but you don't you don't have any journal entry. It's not a financial event. Um, this slide that I have up now just is showing the summary of the effects of stock transactions on assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity. So it shows how issuing common stock increases your assets because you get cash, right? And your stockholders' equity increases because your common stock goes up. If we buy treasury stock, we have less cash and less stockholders' equity. When we sell our treasury stock, we get more cash again and more stockholders' equity. When we declare a cash dividend, it increases our liabilities, but it does not have any effect on, on assets or, well, on assets, it does decrease our retained earnings, which is stockholders' equity. Once we pay a cash dividend, we are reducing our cash, which is an asset, and reducing our liabilities. When we do a stock dividend, it doesn't have any effect on anything, and a stock split doesn't have any effect on anything. So when we look at the stock market value or the market capitalization, the market price multiplied by the number of shares outstanding. Um, the overall market assessment of the worth of a share of common stock is reflected in the price earnings ratio. The the PE ratio is one of the, the top ratios to look at if you're thinking about investing in stock. It, people used to look at earnings per share, but it, that's kind of um, out, of popularity, uh, out of popularity right now, and people look at the price earnings ratio. This is the market price of one share of common stock divided by the earnings per share of the common stock. It's just a measure on if you want to invest in the stock or not. If you have redeemable, redeemable preferred stock, the company has to redeem that stock at a set price. The liquidation value is the amount that the company must pay a preferred stockholder in the event the company goes out of business. That can all be set up in the charter. The book value per share is the amount of common stockholders' equity on the company's book for each share of stock. And here's a couple of um, things to look at. Our return on on that um, our ROA, return on assets, times our leverage ratio for our return on equity. 
and the formulas are just given here. The last section that we would want to talk about, and it's really good that we, we mentioned this again and because when we move on to Chapter 12, we'll be doing the cash flows chapter, the, the fund cash flows chapter. So on the statement of cash flows under the financing transactions, we have um, the issuance of stock, the purchase back of treasury stock, and our dividends. Those are the three main stock transactions. Once we issue the stock, that's going to increase our cash. If we purchase back treasury stock, that's going to decrease our cash. If we pay out dividends, that's going to decrease our cash. If we resell that treasury stock after we have purchased it, that will increase our cash again. So that's what we're looking at. How, does, how do these transactions affect our cash? Just a couple exhibits that look at the different um, ways that stock can be stated out on our financial statements. Here's a stockholder's equity, a detailed stockholder's equity. Again, as you're working through your homework, sometimes you'll have to look at this 8% of $10 par. 8% of $10 is how much? Eighty cents, that's right. So it'd be eighty cents per share if it were, were paying out stocks. And that's all the slides.